uh, I have an announcement for you, for the public, if you have the courtesy to listen to me for a second. Prof professor, uh, the works are about to start. Uh, we have a little change in the proceedings in the sense that Mr. Russo will speak in Italian. I hope this is not a problem. Uh, everybody here can have the translation. If you don't understand Italian and if you want to hear the translation, you have these things available for everybody. So it's just, you have to get them. Nice to meet you. No? Is it one more person? Buonasera, benvenuti a questa sessione di questo incontro. Io sono Giovanni Russo, farò il moderatore di questa sessione. Eh, ringrazio l'ambasciatore Minuto Rizzi per questo invito, chiedo scusa per non aver preparato una mini introduzione e per l'utilizzazione della lingua italiana. Eh, sono particolarmente contento di essere qui eh, questa sera perché il tema di cui ci occupiamo è un tema che ha segnato gli ultimi anni della mia attività professionale. Io sono il vice procuratore nazionale antimafia e antiterrorismo e mi occupo da otto anni dell'area dei Balcani, quindi degli aspetti criminali che riguardano quest'area geografica. Quindi per me è un grande piacere di potermi confrontare con gli illustri ospiti eh, su queste tematiche e condividere degli aggiornamenti sulla situazione in questa area del nostro eh, territorio mondiale. Eh, darei la parola a Mr. Peter Newman, che è il direttore dell'International Center for the Study of Radicalization del King's College di Londra eh, e eh, immagino che ci voglia eh, far sentire il suo pensiero, il suo commento su questi aspetti, su questi aspetti della radicalizzazione che stanno eh, alimentando nuove eh, masse di eh, combattenti, di guerrieri di questa terribile piaga del terrorismo che si va espandendo e consolidando nelle zone di tutto il mondo, di tutta l'Europa e che trova nell'area dei Balcani dei significativi focolai. The floor is yours. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to you. Thanks to Ambassador Minuto Rizzo for having me here. Um, I'm speaking to you as a researcher who's been studying terrorism and radicalization for nearly 20 years now. But I'm also speaking to you as the current OSCE Special Representative on countering violent extremis uh, extremism position that I've held for about 11 months. And in that position, in that role, I've gone to the Western Balkans a number of times. I've made visits to five countries. I've spoken to a large number of people, all the way from ministers down to ordinary representatives of civil society, young people. So, What I want to tell you is how I see the situation and what I've recommended to the OSCE should be done. My argument is very simple and straightforward. It is the following. It is that there is a need for all of Europe to engage more deeply 
on countering violent extremism in the Western Balkans, and now is the time to do it. There's a need, and now is the time to do it. And what I want to briefly say, if this works, <laughs> doesn't, can you just uh, forward the slide? Excellent, yes. <coughs> and uh, what I want to do is to first briefly say why the Western Balkans matter, not only in terms of what happens in the Western Balkans themselves, but to all of Europe. Second, I want to give you some of the priorities that I have identified during my visits, and finally, highlight some of the challenges that I see lying ahead. Two caveats before I begin. First of all, of course, it is completely wrong to reduce the Western Balkans to a breeding ground of terrorism. And we all know that this is a much more diverse and interesting region. And I apologize for making, for focusing very much on that particular aspect. It happens to be my area of expertise and this is a security conference. Second caveat, there's obviously a lot of diversity within that region. And uh, this is not something I can do justice to in 15 minutes of presentation. With that out of the way, let me tell you, and again, could you please click? Let me, and again, and uh, let me quickly tell you why I believe the Western Balkans matter in relation to counterterrorism and countering violent extremism. First and most obvious reason is perhaps because they have been a source of weapons and people who end up within the European Union. The guns in the Bataclan attacks in November 2015 in Paris were acquired in the Balkans, and we know that it was through the Balkans that the terrorists who carried out that atrocity went back to their European home countries. Both, both of these types of transfer, uh, transfer of people and transfer of dangerous goods via the Balkans into the European Union remain a significant reason for concern. And especially now that the physical so-called caliphate is coming to an end, and especially now that a lot of European countries expect people to return to their European home countries, there's a good chance that some of these people will attempt to travel through the Balkans or in fact end up getting stuck there. So now is the time to prepare for that. The second reason, precisely, is that the Balkans are of course uh, in many ways linked to Western and Northern European countries. There are significant diaspora populations to the extent that extremist networks often actually cross borders and in some cases span the entire continent. Very significant number of Swedish foreign fighters, for example, were of Bosnian origin. And conversely, the radical preachers whose videos inspired people inside of Bosnia were in some cases located in Austria. So it makes no sense to actually only look at the Western Balkans. This is in fact a trans-European phenomenon that needs to be looked at in a trans-European way. And let me try this now. Ah, the third and final reason why the Western Balkans matter to Europe is because terrorist attacks in a place like Bosnia, for example, could have a very significant, very significant uh, negative effect in terms of reigniting ethnic conflict. I don't want to be gloomy, but look at what three or four terrorist attacks in France have achieved. French society today is more polarized, more divided, more fragile than ever before. Before the elections, one journalist said it's a country on the verge of a nervous breakdown. And that's not because of a mass movement of terrorists. It's not because of millions of people on the streets. It's because of the actions of a few dozen bad people. And if that can happen in a country like France, with strong institutions, with a very long history, imagine what terrorists can do to some of the countries that are younger, uh, that have more brittle institutions, and where perhaps the fault lines of recent conflicts haven't completely healed. So yes, terrorism is not a mass phenomenon, not here, not in the Balkans, um, but it's always just a few people that have an extraordinary impact on society. I mean not just physical destruction, but also political and psychological destruction. In some cases in the Western Balkans, these countries could be tinderboxes where just one spark reignites 
a problem that is much bigger. And that means we have no choice but to care about the Western Balkans, what happens there in terms of counterterrorism affects all of us. It's a region of strategic importance and there's a lot to do. Let me give you quickly three of the priorities. Your first priority, I believe, is classical police training and capacity building. That doesn't mean countries in the Western Balkans are uniformly badly equipped or that capacity is uniformly bad, it's not. Very competent practitioners, but in practically all countries, they could benefit from tapping into the expertise of more experienced countries, especially within the European Union. And this could be capacity building in terms of counterterrorism laws, prosecutions, building up specialized expertise, for police forces, technology, better platforms for sharing data, et cetera, et cetera. The ability to better police also what I would consider auxiliary crimes, things that are being done, for example, in terms of financing terrorism, smuggling. All of this is necessary. It's not happening everywhere to the same extent and at the required speed. And we have to look carefully now where we can perhaps improve. The second priority is in the area of countering violent extremism. Every country in the region, I believe, should have a so-called referral mechanism. Referrals are typically um, early warning systems where people who display, uh, who display signs of radicalization are being spotted, reported, and dealt with through a non-coercive intervention, be it by social services, psychologists, theologians, the community. This is something that exists in many countries, from Germany to Britain to the Netherlands, now also in France. It's generally believed to be a very good success, which allows governments to deal with cases early and in a way that frees up the time and energy and resources of law, and, uh, law enforcement and intelligence. Kosovo, in fact, earlier this year, uh, has started making its first experiences with this Serbia, with the help of the OSCE, is building up a similar capacity in its municipal safety councils. These are good initiatives that I would like to see replicate. And the final and third priority, I believe, should be prisons. And this is, I think, the most predictable issue. We know that prisons can be breeding grounds for radicalization. We know the number of people with terrorism-related convictions has increased and will continue to increase significantly. And we know that many of them, especially in countries in the Western Balkans, will be out within relatively short periods of times, often two or three years. Um, so what are we doing? Every country should be preparing a plan now, should study what other countries are doing, what can be learned from successes and failure, uh, resource it properly. And in doing so, think not just about the time spent in prison, but also think about what happens to people after they are being released. Now is the time to do so. So these are my priorities. So finally, let me conclude with the challenges. The first challenge is um, duplication, no doubt. Uh, the Balkans, and I followed that for some years, have recently been discovered by the international countering violent extremism community. Now in several countries, international actors are falling over themselves. NATO, the EU, national governments, even the World Bank is now active in countering violent extremism, apparently. Lots of CVE initiatives in some places, reaching out to the same people, engagement is often quite superficial. Different initiatives are not sufficiently coordinated with each other. I've heard this complaint many, many times in different capitals. We need better coordination, and you'd expect me to say this, but I say it anyway. The OSCE should, in my view, be the lead actor because it is, in many places in the Western Balkans, the strongest actor on the ground. It has very good field operations. They know the local players. They know the local dynamics. They've been there for a long time, and they are well connected. So I believe the OSCE should be in charge of coordinating these efforts. The second challenge is that the international community is often going for what in English you call the low-hanging fruit, the easy targets, not necessarily those that require the most intense engagement. So, for example, there's a huge amount of international activity in Kosovo because it's a place that is easy to reach out to, where the international community has a very heavy footprint, 
And so the number of initiatives there is very large. In Bosnia, where arguably there's more need, it is considerably smaller. And in Macedonia, until recently, it's been almost non-existent, even though Macedonia has in fact produced a very significant number of foreign fighters that have gone to Syria. By the way, even half of the people from Kosovo who joined ISIS in Syria actually were radicalized by a guy who was based in Skopje, and they were from a number of small villages directly on the border with Macedonia. It's more difficult, or it was more difficult, to do this kind of work in Macedonia, and Bosnia for sure, but that's where it is most needed. And international engagement should be driven by need, not by the ease of access. Final point, and then I'll end. There are, of course, huge structural problems in the Western Balkans, which simply will not go away and which have an impact on radicalization. I'm under no illusion about this. There's economic stagnation. There is a perception amongst young people that they have no perspective in their home countries. There's a perception that their country's political systems are corrupt, that they are dysfunctional. There's ethnic division in many countries. And each one of the fault lines that I've just mentioned each one of them are being exploited by violent extremists for the purposes of recruitment and radicalization. They are the structural conditions that make recruitment narratives resonate. They're not the sole cause, but they are, if you want, the fertile ground on which extremist narratives flourish, sometimes quite literally so. One of the first speakers mentioned it, the influx of money from the Gulf, from Saudi, from Qatar, in Kosovo and Bosnia has not been entirely positive. But if you ask me, I understand it. When a country that hasn't been able to generate economic growth, where opportunities are sparse, I find it understandable that they will not turn down what seems like free money coming into the country. So yes, we need to work on all the things that I've described. They will not necessarily solve the problem entirely. There are structural factors that are really difficult but it's very important to start building consensus and to start building action. Now is the time to do it seriously and rigorously. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Ringrazio davvero il direttore Newman e mi fa piacere sottolineare come la Direzione Nazionale Antimafia e Antiterrorismo Italiana abbia dato vita con l'OSCE di Belgrado eh, ad una operazione che va nel senso della seconda delle priorità, della prima delle priorità che ha indicato, quella della capacity building. Eh, noi abbiamo dato vita ad una conferenza permanente dei procuratori, quindi magistrati che si occupano delle indagini, di eh, 14 paesi dell'area balcanica. Abbiamo realizzato una rete, grazie al supporto dell'OSCE, una rete di cooperazione investigativa e giudiziaria diretta, proprio per scambiarci quelle buone prassi, proprio per condividere quelle preoccupazioni che sono state così ben espresse. Quindi sono particolarmente grato del contributo di idee che ha fornito e del supporto che l'OSCE dà alla lotta alla criminalità organizzata e alla criminalità terroristica in questa area. Eh, passerei la parola adesso a Miss Matenia Sirseludi, che è una researcher dell'Institute for Police and Security Research dell'Università di Brema, a cui chiederei, ehm, nell'esposizione di Mr. Newman ci ha parlato di eh, tre problemi, tre priorità e tre sfide. Eh, uno degli aspetti più problematici che mi ha colpito è quello che ha espresso l'allarme la, per un'attività terroristica insistita, un attacco terroristico che possa mettere in difficoltà dei paesi più giovani, i paesi che non hanno una struttura sociale, eh, politica, democratica forte. Eh, vi è d'altra parte l'esigenza che 
le attività di contrasto a questo tipo di criminalità avvengano sempre nel rispetto della rule of law. Come combinare queste due esigenze? Da un lato quello di rafforzare dei paesi che non sono forse ancora attrezzati compiutamente per fare fronte a questo tipo di attacco, senza però uscire fuori dai binari del rispetto della rule of law. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, first of all, thanks for having me here. It's a pleasure to be in Rome and it's an honor to be invited here. Thanks, Ambassador Minuto Rizzo. Thanks for the friendly introduction and the difficult question <laughs> of the moderator to present solutions here. I was uh, quite happy with my four speaker that you were so into practice, what we have to do, where are the deficits, where, how can we fill them, uh, what are the policies that we, we have to introduce and where are the cooperation nexuses where we have to, uh, to intensify the synergies. Um, you asked me about uh, how we could strengthen weak states without uh, compromising the rule of law, kind of. Um, i will, I will make the detour of the challenge of uh, organized crime and uh, terrorism that uh, is challenging the new states in the Balkans, who are weak states. And um, I have a small solution. <laughs> and uh, I begin with, uh, it's, it's very similar to the, to the beforehand. Uh, why, why do we look at the Balkans when we talk about jihad? And although I kept my father's name, I, I, I work and live and am German and live in Germany and do my studies referring to Germany. So when you think about Balkans and Jihad, uh, the, the thoughts go quite back. So we had already one of the most important uh, attacks that had been foiled in 2007 uh, with the Rammstein plot. That was a group of guys who actually wanted to go to Chechnya. They did not uh, manage to go to Chechnya. They, they joined a group in Uz, uh, an Uzbek group uh, close to the Afghanistan-Pakistan region, but they were radicalized by Bosnian war veterans. This was Reda Seyam, who radicalized them, who was at the time in, the, in Bosnia, he was a uh, um, member of the Mujahideen group at the time. He was one of the beginners of the video footages. He was uh, a cameraman for jihad at the very early days when, when this uh, was not fashionable as it is nowadays. They were playing football <coughs> with decapitated heads of their enemies. So this was filmed by, uh, by the, he's an Egyptian, but then he came back to Germany. And then he radicalized these people and other people as well. At the end, he lived in Berlin. And I think about 2013, he left uh, to, to Syria and Iraq and become a high-ranking member in ES. So it's, it's, it's a long way from Bosnian war to IS, but there is continuity. And uh, for example, this was a man, uh, this was a very important uh, influencer. And the uh, Rammstein plot was, uh, was foiled. It was an attack that, uh, atta uh, that uh, was attempting to, to uh, with explosives, to attack uh, an American airbase, the airport uh, in Frankfurt and other localities. So this is one trajectory that is relevant in this case. The second one, I think, is uh, we had the new times today. We had uh, a an, an foiled attack in Pristina, in Kosovo, where seven people tried to attack an Israeli football team. I think you all might know about that. Uh, they were radicalized in Albania. We had a small research project in Albania. We were trying to find out what is happening there uh, concerning jihad, and we had a small travel there last year. So we had these different cases. Um, It's quite interesting. So you have the, 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 the capacity of jihadi groups attacking in their own countries, in the Balkans. So they, they, it can be a trajectory to Europe, it can be a trajectory to their own countries, but we also had a very important ethnic Albanian uh, jihadi foreign fighter group in uh, joining ES, led by uh, Latvim Muhajeri. Very, very uh, ironic. He was working for NATO <laughs> before, he, before he became radicalized. Um, But I think this, this is not a, a crucial component in his biography. I think there are others. He was leading a brigade about 500 Albanians, uh, ethnic Albanians from Kosovo, from Macedonia, from Albania, from the diaspora, as you mentioned, the relevant point. And uh, there was once there was a news in the Daily Mail that he had, he had left uh, Iraq and Syria to join uh, with 400 people towards Europe. <laughs> 
uh, nowadays, I think uh, he's dead. He's, he's, he's said to be dead, killed by a drone strike in 2017, uh, so last summer. And uh, in, in, in terrorism research, we, we see that once uh, a language and a nationality is becoming dominant in a certain area where jihad is taking place, this become, makes it more attractive to people to join. That means when you have a battalion, a, a group joining there with an Albanian leader who's making videos in Albanian language, uh, then you will have more Albanians joining. May they come from Switzerland, may they come from Germany, from whichever diaspora region or from whichever autochthonous uh, location. So I think these are the, the three points. So it's not only the weak states in, in, in the Balkans that are affected, but I think the Balkans are, are a crucial point because I call it what the Americans call the, the Central uh, America. It's our weak underbelly. It's, it's not uh, the Balkans that they are. It's, it's very close to Italy. It's, it's, it's not far away from Germany. Our first radicals came to, to, to Bosnia. We had, we had hospitals in Germany for, for wounded mu, uh, Mujahideen from the Bosnian war. So I think uh, it's, it's, it's a broader question. Um, also, when you talk about theory, I said I'm not that much a practical person. I'm, I'm on the academic. I do not do policy. I try to understand. And uh, we, have, we have a hypothesis, and it's proven, it's an empirical truth, kind of, that um, wh once you have a war somewhere, you will have spillover effects. And the spillover effects um, are, have three components. One is the geographic proximity, of course. It was Turkey who was uh, immensely influenced by the, uh, by the war in Syria. But uh, the Balkans are not that far away from the Middle East. It's just on the other side of the Mediterranean. The second point is existing terrorist groups. If you have terrorist groups in your country, the probability that you will have more terrorist groups in the jihadi field is, is, is quite high. It's higher than if you have none of them. That's uh, the, the, the difference between Eastern European countries and more Western and Southern European countries. So I think this is a given as well in the Balkans. In Albania, we found out that it was not really a terrorist groups. Albania was used as a safe haven. It was, it was uh, Islamic foundations that under the umbrella of being legal, legal entities were also funding terrorist groups. We had all of them there. We had uh, Bin Laden's brother, we had the uh, Algerian Jihad, uh, we had uh, Egyptian Jihad in Albania. So they, but they were merely transferring money and building, let's say, radicalizing nexuses. It was, it was fertile ground. It was not a funding of terrorism, but it was a funding of radicalization that showed its effect 10, 15, 20 years later. And I think this is something that, that now could bridge to your question, to the, to the rule of law, because Albania was a very interesting case, because um, when you look into history, after the totalitarian system failed, or was over, kind of, uh, Albania tried to transform itself. And the um, European Union asked Albania to fulfill certain rules, to fulfill certain criteria, to become a member of, of the Western uh, community. And uh, one of it was freedom of religion. <laughs> Albania had forbidden religion for decades. It was forbidden to show religion, to be religious. And once, uh, once they changed the law, um, they had no infrastructure to cope with these new groups. And um, after the, 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 the Bosnian war, there was, a, there was the idea in, in, in certain Muslim, major Muslim countries that the Muslims in the Balkans have to be helped. Hmm? So there was, there was involvement of, of the Gulf and nowadays much more of Turkey as well. There are different types of Islamism now taking place there. And you might all know better than me, the experts. Um, but uh, but um, the state was too weak to cope with these foundations. This was before 9-11. After 9-11, I think the international community, the American, the, the, the United States and uh, other countries pressurized Albania to cope with these foundations. They throw them out. They changed uh, names sometimes, but most <coughs> of them were away. Still the fertile ground was there. And still it was very interesting to see that um, it was the same regions where, uh, where these foundations had their first recruitment uh, waves. The same marginalized regions in urban setting and in rural settings as well that nowadays provide uh, the, the new uh, recruitment, uh, the, the new recruitees from, for the foreign fighter wave that's left to Syria and Iraq. 
So uh, when it comes to how shall we cope with, with these challenges without neglecting the rule of law, I think it's not that difficult. I think uh, I, maybe similar to, to what Peter said before, there are, there are paradigms to cope with that we already know in some countries. I think what, I'm, I'm not sure if you mentioned it, what we do and what is quite important because I think the external factor plays a role. It's not the autochthonous Muslim communities which always refer to the Ottoman Empire, to the tolerant Islam that they had. It's, uh, it's something that is perceived as being, as being uh, coming from the outside. So I think strengthening the Muslim communities um, would, would help. In Germany nowadays, we have, we have in universities, we um, educate imams that are compatible to our state. So we educate people who then educate other people. So we try to, 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 to help to build uh, an, an Islam, a religion that is compatible and that uh, fits much better to the, to, the, to, the, to the needs and to the challenges that people have to face in a liberal democracy like in Germany. And I think this would be an interesting point because what the Muslim community, we did many interviews, and what the Muslim community says, all these radicalization efforts take place outside of our uh, umbrella organization. These are mosques that are not controlled because we don't want them, because they are foreigners, they are different, they are Salafis usually. And uh, so I think we, we need integration systems there. The second point would be, uh, you talk about violent extremism, yes. Um, I think we should maybe go further because we have noticed that uh, prevention of terrorism is one thing that we focus on violence. We have to also look more backwards towards the radicalization, we have to stop radicalization as well. We have to, to, to think about the bigger movement, not about the violent uh, people. So, and in the academic field, this means that we, we have both, we have this, uh, this um, old terror crime nexus, which combines terrorist groups, organized crime, illegal foundations, and the new terrorist uh, crime nexus, that is what your team uh, researched on, where we see that it's, it's petty crime. And uh, I think we have to, to, to keep both in mind. So I think. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, very much. I don't feel. <laughs> Grazie molte. Um, si, si può sintetizzare il, il suo intervento con uno slogan: um, challenge, sfide. Il territorio dei Balcani è veramente l'occasione per delle sfide importanti. E gli esempi concreti che lei ci ha raccontato. Eh, anche con riferimento a quest'ultima ehm, pratica che trovo veramente apprezzabile della, mh, che avviene in Germania, cioè questa formazione dell'imam affinché si, si abbia la certezza su quello che poi l'imam va a predicare o, va, o come va a formare, è veramente un'ottima un, un, un idea. Passerei adesso la, la parola a Mr. Tobias Freeman che è Senior Legal Officer del Syracuse International Institute for Criminal Justice and Human Rights di, appunto, di Siracusa. E ehm, gli proporrei questa considerazione. In relazione agli andamenti eh, militari della eh, strategia e poi delle evoluzioni che eh, l'ISIS ha subito nel corso degli ultimi mesi, noi giuristi, noi ricercatori, del, analizzatori del fenomeno del terrorismo abbiamo incontrato prima la figura del foreign fighters, cioè del soggetto che si addestrava e ritornava pronto a combattere la sua jihad in, nel, in Europa, poi siamo passati ai lupi solitari che eh, agivano abbastanza disconnessi rispetto ad una rete più composita ai, ai veri e propri comando. Adesso l'ultima figura che risulta dalle nostre investigazioni è quella dei frustrated travelers, cioè dei eh, viaggiatori che non sanno se, eh, non hanno più un luogo certo dove andare a portare il loro messaggio, la loro azione di morte. Come considera lei la situazione da questo punto di vista e con riferimento anche all'area balcanica? Um, I, uh, my name is Tobias Freeman, as you know, but I've, I've, this evening I am Professor Louise Shelley, uh, who's unable to join us tonight. Uh, she's asked me to 
deliver this presentation. I firstly want to thank uh, Ambassador Minul Torizo for the invitation to be here. It's a, it's a pleasure. Um, could we, okay. Oh, here. Thank you very Sorry. much. And I apologize in advance if this Sorry. is not as smooth as it should be. Uh, Professor Shelley's uh, presentation is, is thus. <clears throat> uh, focusing on corruption and crime networks in the Balkans, uh, there are eff effectively three sources of corruption um, that Professor Shelley has identified. The first being one state, one party states and authorita authoritarian rule. The second being corruption of conflict periods and resource scarcity and the third being corruption associated with the rise of uh, an institutionalization of crime groups. Um, in particular, there are increasing problems of human smuggling through and facilitated in the Balkan region. Um, in addition, the presentation will cover routes, trafficking routes particularly, routes for smuggling uh, that during the Ottoman period still persist today. Uh, whilst they were cut off during the period of communist rule, uh, where they were, they were, um, they were <coughs> temporarily suspended, they were rapidly recon reconstituted thereafter. Uh, there were routes for different forms of illicit trade that crossed the Balkans and illicit networks uh, from this region play a key role on transit into Europe. Uh, there are a number of key areas in which the linkage has been drawn by uh, Professor Shelley and I'll turn to those in, uh, in turn. The first being drugs. Okay, firstly to drugs. The professor has identified Turkish drug trafficking organizations uh, building on historical smuggling routes uh, that have been working with crime groups in the Balkans to move heroin to Europe. In relation to people, Bulgarian, Hungarian and Turkish groups are often facilitators, moving individuals from the east through the Balkans to Western Europe, following trajectories already established in the Ottoman era. Balkan traffickers operate within family groups, often functioning within overseas communities. Data from Europol suggests the presence of numerous networks rather than larger consolidated ones. In 2013 to 14, Europol re received reports on 6,000 organized groups involved in human trafficking. The vast majority, 90%, were involved in sexual exploitation. 5.6% concerned cases of labor exploitation, 1.9% was on forced sham marriages, and 0.3% were involved in forced criminality and begging. Uh, these data may be more representative of citizen concerns than reflect the actual distribution of victims. About 70% of European citizen, citizens suspected to be involved in human trafficking are citizens of Bulgaria, Hungary, Romania, and Slovakia. Europol has identified participants in this business from over 100 countries and estimated 50,000 criminals involved in this trade. Europol estimated that at the height of the refugee crisis in 2013, smuggling into Europe generated between 4.7 billion and 5.7 billion euros. The most common countries of origin of the smugglers included some of the Eastern European countries associated with human trafficking, but also Balkan countries. Uh, including Kosovo and Serbia, that have been part of smuggling routes. In relation to arms trade, Balkan groups are active in weapons trade. Uh, the belief is that they are among the suppliers to the drug markets in Belgium, where arms were purchased uh, that were used in terrorist attacks. Also, there are uh, also, there are online marketplaces for arms operating in Eastern Europe and the Balkans that are also believed to supply black market weapons to Western Europe. In relation to cigarettes, <coughs> the Time Magazine Man of the Year, um, in particular the award that was given to, in 2005, uh, sorry, 2015 to Milo Djukanovic, Djukanovic, 
Drukanovic, thank you, uh, who served either as President or Prime Minister of Montenegro from 1991 to 2016. As one of the nominators for the highly competitive award, uh, stated, this individual, the last European dictator, has captured our country for his own private interests and turned it into a safe haven for criminals. While he, his family and friends enrich themselves, ordinary people suffer from poverty, injustice, lawlessness, uh, while those who dare to talk about corruption become his targets. Among the many cited crimes that merited this distinction was his major role in cigarette smuggling, for which he was particularly singled out in the award statement. The distinguished jury of OCCRP concluded that he and his, his close associates, and I quote, engaged in extensive cigarette smuggling with the, uh, the Italian Sacra Corona Unita and Camorra crime families. He was indicted in Bari and freely admitted the trade, but said that his country needed money. He invoked diplomatic immunity to get the charges dropped. Furthermore, while he claims to have stopped the smuggling, OCCRP found an island off the coast financed by his family bank and owned by his good friend Stanko Subano, Subotu, Subotic, a controversial businessman who was three times indicted but never convicted of cigarette smuggling related activities. The island was run by his head of security and was being used to smuggle cigarettes with some of the same organized crime figures that were previously involved. The forensic evidence for this award was strong. The Italian courts presented wiretapped derived evidence and hundreds of thousands of documents to show that the Montenegrin government was making 700 million annually from this illicit trade in the 1990s. And the Italian mafia groups behind this trade laundered, laundered $1 billion uh, through Swiss banks based in Lugano. The Italian authorities <coughs> showed that this massive illicit tr uh, cigarette trade went straight to the top. He was behind, this individual was behind the enormous racket. That's, uh, that's Professor Shelley's presentation. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here and to represent the Siddiquza International Institute for Criminal Justice and Human Rights. A mouthful, uh, but, uh, but an institute that's been around for more than 45 years. The institute, by, for those who, who aren't familiar with it, works predominantly in technical assistance and capacity building as well as research. Uh, and in the course of the last 45 years has trained more than 50,000 criminal justice officers, including judges, prosecutors, police, uh, and related law enforcement officers. Uh, both of my colleagues on the panel have mentioned the movement of people and goods across borders, and I'd like to also discuss this issue uh, from a different perspective uh, slightly, although there's obvious complementarity between them. That is, uh, I'd like to discuss illicit trade as a common threat uh, but as a also as a strategic opportunity for a new phase in engagement between the EU and between the Western Balkans. This is not an issue of illicit trade that is unique to the region, it's, it's a global issue, but one which uh, Southeastern Europe and in particular the Western Balkans is particularly uh, important. Uh, my, I'll divide my remarks into three parts. The first, uh, addressing illicit trade as a, as a threat. Uh, the second, addressing illicit trade as an opportunity. And the third, I'd like to briefly introduce a new project uh, that we've recently commenced uh, in Southeastern Europe, building on work that we've been doing in the Balkans over, over several years. Firstly, uh, the concept of illicit trade, what, what is it <laughs> precisely? It's not a term that has any concrete definition. Um, it means different things in different contexts. In truth, it is a relatively new concept used to categorize a range of related criminal phenomena. The underlying activities when we speak of illicit trade though, however, are far from new. They are, they've been with us since the dawn of trade, since the, since the dawn of and acceleration of globalization. Practically speaking, illicit trade is considered to comprise a number of sectors. Sectors that in the, in the region of Western Balkans, but more broadly across uh, Southeastern Europe, are generally considered to be narcotic drugs and psychotropic substances, human trafficking, tobacco trafficking and the trafficking of other excisable goods, as well as cultural property. We hear these terms quite frequently. 
Additionally, of course, there are a range of other sectors of illicit trade that raise problems in different regions and in different countries. In fact, each country faces its own specific challenges. And this has resulted in what, is, what could be characterised as a sector-specific approach to the phenomenon. What we see in a practical sense is that both at the national and the international level, this sectoral approach leads to the creation of specialised teams, departments, and sometimes even dedicated institutions who deal with each specific crime area. <coughs> Often, these crimes are addressed in isolation. This is true for the Western Balkans as it is for Europe as a whole. Fundamentally, this creates enormous challenges when it comes to cooperation, communication between different bodies with different mandates that frankly overlap with one another. And it has led to a fragmented approach to illicit trade uh, and related crime areas, with the result that we see criminal justice silos both at the national and the international level. But we know these forms of crime are related. There are interdependencies, and this is something that is within the, well, something that is uh, Professor Shelley's area of expertise. There are interdependencies and convergences between different forms of crime uh, in every context when it comes to the topic of illicit trade. Uh, these different convergences depend on the opportunities as they presented themselves, and this is connected to my second point, illicit trade is opportunity. We know that illicit trade is also connected to other criminal phenomena. For example, and most particularly, organised crime and corruption. These crime areas have been a focus for the region for, for a very long time. How are they connected to illicit trade? Because it's quite often considered that they are synonymous with that form of crime. In my view, organised crime is a mechanism. It's a modality for committing crime, but not a crime in and of itself. Corruption, on the other hand, is a facilitator, not just of organised crime, but of illicit trade-related crimes more broadly. If organised crime is a mechanism and corruption is a facilitator, then from my perspective, illicit trade is the opportunity on the ground, the market opportunity, that in turn fuels both organised crime and corruption. It is closely connected to the phenomena of organised crime and corruption, but it is not the same thing. Yet, to date, illicit trade has only been indirectly addressed through the frameworks of organised crime and corruption. And this is particularly true of the Western Balkans, but this is the European approach more broadly. Therefore, policies and action plans and legislation address the phenomena of organised crime and corruption, but illicit trade is indirectly addressed through the course of those. From the Institute's perspective, this does not give a, a sufficiently clear or complete picture to properly understand illicit trade, which is a complex cross-sectoral phenomenon demanding a holistic cross-sectoral response. Current EU policy priorities are highly sectoral in nature. We see significant work done on drugs, human trafficking, tobacco and arms. <laughs> In addition, there's a lot of work that's been done in cross-sectoral issues such as organised crime, corruption, money laundering and terrorist financing, as well as cybercrime, of course. My point today uh, is that currently there is no common approach or policy position that exists at the national, regional or international level that deals with illicit trade as a cross-sectoral problem. My view, and, and what I'd like to share with you today, is, is merely an idea, and that is that a new and integrated policy response to illicit trade is well overdue, and that this has potential opportunities for engagement between the EU and the Western Balkans. The benefits of such an approach that, that treats the phenomenon in a holistic, cross-sectoral way are, are several fold. <clears throat> uh, some examples would be that it would address a missing link in the policy framework. That is the, the, uh, the link of the market opportunity that fuels organised crime and corruption. It would provide a novel framework for engaging on issues of mutual interest, and these are closely tied to regional security and stability. It would likely serve, in addition, to reinvigorate and bolster ongoing efforts to combat organised crime and corruption from a different angle, however. And this would include a thorough evaluation of the implementation of existing plans and strategies from a cross-sectoral perspective. This has been a challenging to existent, uh, existing policy approaches. In turn, such an approach would be an opportunity to, for, for, for leadership on the issue, frankly, 
uh, that could also boost the EU's credibility in a new and uncertain geopolitical environment. I'd like to turn to, from the abstract, more or less, to the, to the practical and introduce a, a two-year research and capacity building project on strengthening the fight uh, against illicit trade in southeastern Europe a project that is supported by PMI Impact, uh, a new grant initiative of Philip Morris International. The objectives of the project from a criminal justice perspective are threefold. The first is to identify the practical challenges and obstacles in the fight against illicit trade. The second is to identify and develop innovative cross-sectoral recommendations for strengthening the criminal justice response, promoting regional harmonization, not so much from the perspective of normative or legal frameworks, but in terms of practices, as well as to foster both informal and formal regional cooperation. Thirdly, the project seeks to strengthen further the capacity of criminal justice officers at the national level. The project covers 12 countries, 12 countries in southeastern Europe, from Slovenia across to Bulgaria, down to Turkey and Greece. Obviously, a, a broader geographical scope than, than many other projects that have tackled the issues of organised crime and corruption to date. Um, we feel like this broader approach, whilst the Western Balkans itself, uh, there are good reasons for, for, uh, for focusing on the Western Balkans per se, uh, in order to understand the phenomenon of illicit trade, which is effectively a form of cross-border crime, uh, it's, necessar it's, it's necessary to take a broader perspective, but also for the purposes of the effective identification of strategies to combat. First of all, uh, it, it is in, es in essence the first project of its kind uh, to seek to address the criminal justice response to illicit trade from the cross-sectoral perspective, particularly on such a scale. Um, it, in terms of the, the fundamental activities uh, comprised in the project, it will comprise 12 national studies of the practical challenges faced by national officers. Uh, obviously, we're reaching out to a very broad range of national institutions, ministries of, of justice and interior, as well as practitioner institutions most heavily. To address the absence of an integrated policy solution, our approach is to take a bottom-up methodology. That is to speak directly to the practitioners who are doing the work, to draw on their insights, expertise, experience and ideas, particularly of judges, prosecutors, police and customs officers. Beyond this, the project seeks to conduct an additional regional assessment of gaps and needs, but importantly, success stories. Uh, with a view to developing the groundwork for a potential regional strategy, but also to contribute to regional harmonisation and cooperation. In terms of practical outcomes, the project is very much focused on the ownership, obviously, of, of these countries. But beyond that, the project will involve developing training curricula, training activities, both training of trainers and national training sessions, as well as the development of recommendations from a national and a regional perspective. This project won't solve the challenges of illicit trade in and of itself, but it will be the start of a crucial conversation that to date hasn't been had. The hope is that the project will develop a solid evidentiary platform as well as a cooperation framework for, for, for launching the necessary action and in addition to strengthen and better coordinate the fight against illicit trade. Fundamental to achieving this, in our view, is in the, mean, in the medium term developing a new, innovative and common strategy for Europe that tackles illicit trade, which is in the mutual interest, obviously, of all states. Thank you. Thank you very much. Grazie. Uh, grazie veramente. Come dire, sembra che questo concetto tra di interdipendenza e convergenza tra le varie forme di criminalità eh, sia un concetto oramai globale. Eh, vale per lo studio effettuato per i Balcani, ma vale per il nostro Paese, per l'Europa intera. E così anche il, la, 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 come dire, la soluzione non può che essere condivisa, quella proposta dal professor Freeman, cioè quella di una risposta politica integrata e transettoriale. È quello che si prova a fare proprio mettendo insieme le esigenze, le capacità, le eh, pra, migliori prassi 
del, di chi ha lottato di più, di chi ha maturato una maggiore esperienza nella lotta a questa forma di criminalità. E anche l'avvicinamento la, eh, tra il, la, il reato di corruzione, le pratiche corruttive, che sono un facilitatore, l'ha detto benissimo, della criminalità organizzata, è un concetto che esce dalle, emerge dalle nostre indagini, dalle nostre sentenze. Io credo che proprio su, su questa base sarà più facile costruire un terreno comune di reazione e di contrasto. Io proverei a fare un altro giro di domande veloci, con risposte veloci, eh, e vorrei chiedere a um, Mr. Newman, eh, lei ha parlato di, del fenomeno della radicalizzazione, delle pratiche per prevenire la radicalizzazione, eh, ci sono anche tentativi di deradicalizzazione. Eh, noi dal punto di vista proprio sostanzialmente pratico, eh, le, le nostre forze investigative, anche le agenzie di sicurezza, eh, stimano, quotano una cifra oscillante tra i 10.000 e i 20.000 foreign fighters che nel corso dei prossimi sei mesi arriveranno nei Balcani. In particolare si stima che possano avere la Bosnia e il Kosovo come eh, luogo di destinazione. Eh, qui non si tratta più quindi di prevenire la radicalizzazione, ma ci si trova di fronte a soggetti già, eh, che hanno già fatto una scelta di campo. Come contrastare questo fenomeno? Uh, so, thank you very much. Um, I think it's important to understand that um, returning foreign fighters, people who are coming back from Syria, are a phenomenon that is going to preoccupy us for many years to come. And there's a historical precedent. When the conflict in Afghanistan ended in the 1980s, a conflict which had mobilized 20,000 people from across the world to go to Afghanistan and fight against the Soviet Union at that point, the conflict ended, and then over the following two decades, we saw the veterans of that particular conflict turn up in practically every conflict in the Muslim world, but also a significant number of them returned to their home countries. It is, in fact, what created the Al-Qaeda phenomenon that led to 9-11. So one thing that is very important to keep in mind are the time, the time spans. 9-11 happened in 2001. The conflict in Afghanistan ended in 1988. So 13 years after the end of that conflict, you still have an international terrorist network that is essentially based on people who met each other in the 1980s in Afghanistan. And that's why I'm saying that what has happened in Syria over the past five years will probably lead to networks and to atrocities in 10, 15, perhaps even 20 years from now. That's why it's important to start preparing for this now. However, and this is in answer to your question, what we also know from the Afghan experience is that not all 20,000 of them continued to engage in conflict. Some of them, perhaps a minority, we do not know exactly, decided to essentially retire because they did not want to fight anymore or because they were disillusioned, because they wanted to start a family. And so we are seeing the same phenomenon now with people who are coming out of Syria. There are significant numbers who are still dangerous. There are significant numbers who are disturbed and perhaps traumatized but by what they've experienced as part of the conflict. There's also a number of people who are returning who are disillusioned. So they're dangerous, disturbed, disillusioned. Our capacity to reduce terrorism <laughs> depends very much on whether we are able to distinguish between these three groups. And that's why I mentioned in my presentation that in every country that is affected, we need to develop the procedures, the instruments, and the capacity for being able to make those distinctions. Because what's clear, even from Western European countries, let's take Germany, for example. The federal authorities in Germany have opened over 700 investigations into, invi into individuals related to 
zero related to traffic. The justice system will not be able to prosecute every, every single one of those 700. So we need to be smart about it, and that means that we should be able to deal with people who are disillusioned in a different way to people who perhaps have committed atrocities and continue to, to pose a danger. And I think it's important that we help Western Balkan countries to develop that capacity in the way you described before when you, when you responded to my question. Grazie, sì, senz'altro. Eh, come dire, con sollievo vedo che la sua è una visione anche più ottimistica, quindi vanno distinti eh, le, i ruoli e le, le, le scelte che faranno queste persone, quindi non c'è da aspettare questo esercito eh, che cambia solo luogo dove esercitare la violenza, ma c'è da distinguere e da agire per eh, come dire, governare questa situazione. Eh, Miss eh, Sirse Ludi, eh, volevo chiederle, eh, che cosa la, la comunità occidentale, i paesi dell'Europa possono chiedere, cosa possono pretendere dai eh, paesi dei Balcani? Io le faccio un esempio, proprio ultimissime eh, indagini svolte dalle procure del nostro, del nostro paese, quindi italiane, hanno registrato eh, che dall'Albania arrivano sulle coste adriatiche eh, attraverso mezzi di comunicazione ehm, di, per, di spostamento ordinari, quindi navi, treni, aerei, ehm, attraverso le, il mare o attraverso la o via terra, eh, un numero significativo di persone che sono indicate nelle liste come foreign fighters. Eh, secondo gli accordi di prevenzione degli spostamenti di questi soggetti, il paese di partenza, quindi l'Albania, dovrebbe impedire a queste persone di imbarcarsi. L'Albania li lascia arrivare e vengono, vengono accolti nei nostri porti soprattutto, qui vengono identificati, si verifica che sono in queste liste e vengono respinti, quindi c'è il respingimento. Sarebbe, come dire, viene richiesto, verrebbe richiesto all'Albania di essere più cooperativa anche da questo punto di vista, quindi di procedere a, a, a fermare queste persone inserite nelle liste di foreign fighters, non farle attraversare l'Adriatico. Fino a che punto ci si può spingere nel chiedere ai paesi questo tipo di azione? Well, this is This is a difficult question because I have no access to the executives in the Albania. This would be easier I if I would have uh, maybe better capabilities in there. Um, but what you say is, is I think, is, is, is a bigger problem. I think it's, it's lacking cooperation, and we don't see that only in the foreign fighter issue. We have seen the same game in the refugee issue when we had the deals with Erdogan and Merkel and uh, you... Uh, you um, that uh, countries uh, try to avoid uh, being affected by transnational flows, be it illicit trade, be it human trafficking, be it uh, terrorism or, or, or refugees, and uh, we try to, to keep uh, the problem out of our borders. I think the approach is, is uh, yesterday's approach. I think uh, it will not work because uh, Whenever you make borders, uh, they will be circumvented from one or the other way. So we will have to work on a trans-border regime to cope with these issues. I think uh, this, uh, th th there will be no choice. And uh, at the end, um, I think the most interesting part of it is that the community we are talking about, the foreign fighters, they do not think in borders, at least they do not think in, in, in borders like we see them. So as I mentioned, for example, the battalion of the ethnic Albanians, they do not care if they come from Kosovo or from, uh, from Macedonia or from Albania. They see themselves as, as a part of a, a bigger Muslim community as they think that they represent it. And in there, they are the Albanian speaking ones. So they think in Vilayat or caliphates or or other entities. So we have, we have to adopt the few of the people that we have to, 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 to cope with. And um, I'm not sure if, if national approaches with, will help there. I would, I would uh, strictly recommend, 
at the first place, we, we need an EU approach, and this will, would have been my first remarks. In the first panel, we were talking about accession of EU, accession of NATO. Um, we were thinking this, this kind of executive top-down approach of member states, but I think the, the approach will be different. We have issues that we have to cope with with and uh, it doesn't work if if uh, we uh, wait for uh, the the infrastructure and the institutions to be built and then have programs we have to work ad hoc at several issues that uh, confront us all and that's why i brought the the the, the, the examples of the israeli uh, football team of the german uh, veterans and of the foreign fighters who will go all over the place they could go to bali but it's more difficult to cooperate with with asian countries but in the eu and with the neighboring countries in the balkans i think we we will have uh, bigger corporations which which uh, will make it uh, easier for us to cope with this transnational uh, enemy it's 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 an enemy but they don't see themselves in national boundaries so if they can't cross that border and if you now in italy find a regime that that stops albania sending these people or allowing them they will take another route and they might as well arrive in germany or maybe they arrive in milano from another way so it, it i think this this approach is too short term grazie molte um, Mr. Freeman, lei... Okay. <laughs> no, no. Just uh, it's enough one. Just uh, I don't know if he's able to speak also for uh, Ms. Shelley. No, no, no. Okay. Uh, lei ha parlato, ha fatto riferimento a questa categoria del commercio illecito uh, e ha anche spiegato come viene declinato, viene vissuto uh, in vario modo a seconda dell'oggetto del commercio, ha parlato di traffico di esseri umani, di armi, di droghe, eh, di sigarette. Eh, lei vede dietro questo schema anche una rete, una vera e propria rete, o sono degli eventi indifferenziati e, e distinti gli uni dagli altri? Se è vero che la risposta deve essere una risposta eh, abbiamo detto coordinata, ma deriva anche dal fatto che ci sono vere e proprie reti criminali che gestiscono di volta in volta il traffico ritenuto più utile, più attuale. Thank you. I, th I think the simple answer to your question is that interdependencies and convergences are frequently referred to but not properly understood. I think uh, one of the key challenges for initiatives that seek to address illicit trade as a, as a phenomenon is understanding more precisely how the phenomenon works. <coughs> um, and so uh, this is really one of the objectives of, of the project that, that we are we're currently conducting and which started in September this year. It's to properly understand what we mean by cross-sectoral aspects of illicit trade, understand the dynamics of how these crimes do converge. Um, beyond the fact that we don't understand the phenomenon and these particular aspects of the phenomenon as well as we should, it's also true that this changes depending on the situation. It changes on the commodity, where a commodity might be trafficked by a small number of very organised groups. Uh, in turn, it's true that in the Balkans, some commodities are trafficked with a very large number of very disorganized small groups. Uh, so it's, it's true that there are variances. Yes, sure. Thank you. I just wanted to, uh, to add something to this because I think it's really, really important and perhaps by, by way of an anecdote, which some of you may have heard already, um, three years ago, my colleagues and I went to um, the Turkish border areas, uh, the areas from where a lot of people went into Syria to do field work and to interview people. And we stopped in a Kurdish town in Antakya province, which was directly, that, that, that little village was directly on the border with Syria. And we spoke to a Kurdish smuggler, someone who's basically been earning his living his entire life by smuggling things across the border. And he told us over a cup of tea that he's been smuggling everything. 
He's been smuggling alcohol. He's been smuggling cigarettes. Whatever, mon uh, whatever people, uh, people pay him money for because he's a smuggler. And then we asked him if he, as a Kurd, would smuggle an ISIS recruit across the border into Syria, keeping in mind that, of course, ISIS hates the Kurds and the Kurds are fa fighting against ISIS. And his response was, of course, I'm a smuggler. What do you expect? If you pay me well, of course, I will bring that guy over the border into Syria. And here's the point. The point is, this guy is a cigarette smuggler. He's an alcohol smuggler. And suddenly, almost by coincidence, he becomes part of a terrorist network. It's the same thing, where you have these illicit structures. They're used for all sorts of things. So it makes no sense to say, we're looking for terrorist financing, and there are other people who are looking for money laundering and other illicit mm -hmm. networks. It's one global thing, and that's how we have to look at it. And that's why your project is so important, because I think these criminal justice silos prevent us from understanding the convergence between these phenomena. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to add. Grazie ancora per quest'ultimo commento. Sì, bisogna cercare le professionalità. Questo contrabbandiere metteva la sua professionalità a disposizione di qualunque rete o di qualunque traffico e quindi è giusto muovere in questa direzione. Se non ci sono altri, have you any other wings? Did you have other question? Or? No? Okay. Io ringrazio, saluto tutti per la vostra pazienza, penso che sia stato un dibattito particolarmente interessante e ricco di spunti. Eh, abbiamo potuto avere anche la relazione di Miss Shelley che come sapete non è potuta essere qui per un guasto aereo. Eh, penso che possiamo mh, rimandare alla sessione di domani, vero? Grazie a tutti, buonasera. Denise Mazzolani yeah. and Mr.